So, um, so yeah, I'm Richard and this is joint work with Ivan. Um, okay. So just to start with a bit of motivation. So uh, the, the problem that I'm, we're interested in in this talk is, is the problem that was already looked at. It's a classic problem of NMR since the 1990s. And um, that's the problem of conditional inference. And we've already um, had a few, had it mentioned in a couple of talks earlier on as well. So the problem is uh, you've got this conditional knowledge base. Uh, so you've just got a set of conditionals where each conditional uh, is just a pair of propositional sentences with the interpretation that uh, if alpha i, then normally or typically beta i, beta i holds. And what we want in this conditional inference problem is to construct this special relation uh, which holds between sentences alpha and beta if and only if this conditional if alpha then normally beta can be said to follow from the, the, the knowledge base that we're given. So the question is, how do we define uh, this, this, this relation? And many, um, as we've already heard, many um, uh, proposals were made over the years. Uh, such as rational closure, lexicographic closure, and other ones. Um, and most of them, or many of them, uh, they, they assume that the output relation that you get should be a rational consequence relation. So that means that it satisfies all the rules of preferential uh, consequence plus rational monotonicity, which I'm going to get to it a bit more later on. It also means that um, this, this relation should be defined by a ranked interpretation. So a ranked interpretation is, is just a semantic model which assigns to each valuation of the underlying propositional language, it assigns it a, either a natural number or infinity, with the idea being that the number represents the degree of implausibility of that valuation. So infinity means, so here's an example uh, on the right, we've got um, these two valuations which are deemed completely uh, impossible, so they get the rank of infinity. And we've got three valuations down here, uh, which get the, the lowest rank uh, and so on. So each one of these ranked interpretations generates uh, a rational consequence relation. Uh, how does it do that? Well, for each sentence, first of all, you can define the rank of a sentence to be the minimum of the ranks of the valuations which satisfy it. And then the conditional alpha beta holds in a ranked interpretation exactly when the rank of alpha is less than the rank of alpha and not beta. So that's just another way of saying that all the most plausible models of alpha, they all satisfy beta. So for example, in this, in this particular model, we've got B, if B normally F, that holds because if you look at the most normal beta model, so the beta models are the, the middle four, right? And there's just one single most plausible one, which is this one in which F holds. Okay, so, so as I said, many, um, many suggestions were made for this conditional inference problem and one of the most widely, uh, widely known ones uh, is, the, is the rational closure, which we've already heard about today. So this was um, uh, proposed by Leon and Magidor in 1992. And for the rational closure, it generated the ranked interpretation such that every valuation is as plausible as the constraints in the knowledge base will allow. So that's the basic idea. So this ranked interpretation from the previous slide is actually the rational closure of this particular knowledge base. So this is a, it's, it's basically just the Tweety knowledge base that I've got here. So we've got if, if B normally F, if not P implies B then normally bottom. So that's just another way of saying that We've got a hard constraint here that for P implies B, and if P normally not F. Um, so this is the particular, the, the rank, rank interpretation of the rational closure. So we've got, we'd, according to the rational closure, for example, we would conclude here that if not F, then uh, not B. Um, so this is, you know, the, the intuition is quite strong here. It's, it, this is, you, you can make a very strong case that this is actually, what you output here is the, actually the simplest 
ranked interpretation that satisfies the knowledge base. Now, one thing I want to just draw your attention to here is, is the bottom two uh, inter the bottom two valuations. Uh, so these are both the valuations which make not B false and P false. B valuations are not actually constrained at all by the knowledge base we've got here. Um, so the conditional B implies if B then F, that's just the constraint about the B models. This conditional in the middle, the P not P implies B uh, normally bottom, that's just saying that the, the P and not B models that get rank infinity. And the third uh, conditional here is just talking about the P models only. It's, it's only talking about the relative plausibility among the P models. So these bottom two interpretate, bottom two valuations here, they're not constrained at all by the knowledge base. But because we're using a ranked interpretation here, we have to give them a number, right? We could, we could in principle put them anywhere here. We have to give them a number. Rational closure says in that case, let's just put them right at the bottom. All right, so I'm gonna try and tap into that, uh, that again later. But in a sense, it, what it means is it, we, we're getting more conclusions. The, the mere fact that we want a ranked interpretation is actually forcing us to get more conclusions than, than is necessarily justified. So that leads me on to another problem with the rational closure, and that is the fact that, that you, you get a ranked interpretation, which, which is tied in with the fact that the, the ration, a rational consequence relation satisfies rational mo monotonicity. So rational monotonicity is the, is the property that says that if you've got alpha normally beta, if you don't have alpha normally not gamma, then you do conclude alpha and gamma normally beta. So this is a, a characteristic property, but it's not universally accepted. And even in the 1990s, people like David Makinson kind of called it into question, um, suggested it was, it was too strong. More recently, Hans Rott, in connection with belief contraction, has also kind of revisited this, this, this idea of it being a bit too strong. So if it's too strong, what do we do? Well, we could, um, we could, what we could do and what making statue suggested we do is actually we, we consider a wider class of consequence relations, not the rational consequence relation necessarily, uh, but, a, but a weak we, consequence relation which satisfies some kind of weakening of rational monotonicity. And one such weakening is the property of disjunctive rationality, which already appears actually in the 1992 paper of Levin and Magidor, and this says that if you can, if you uh, infer gamma from a disjunction, alpha or beta, then you should infer it from one of the disjuncts, either alpha or beta. So this is a weakening of rational monotonicity. It, it holds for all rational consequence relations, but it's a much less, it seems to be a, a much less controversial uh, property. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at the problem of conditional inference where well, we don't necessarily want the output to be a rational consequence relation, but we, we would like it to be a disjunctive consequence relation. So we're gonna move away from these ranked interpretations, but the good news is that also disjunctive consequence relations have quite a nice semantic, uh, quite a nice semantics attached to them, which is given by something we call interval-based interpretations. So an interval-based interpretation well, basically, rather than just assigning a single number to each valuation, we assign a plausibility interval. So we've got a, a lower rank and an upper rank for each valuation. Then we can define the lower rank of a sentence, gamma to be the minimum of the lower ranks that, of the valuations which satisfy it, and similarly for the upper ranks. And then each interval-based interpretation then yields a consequence relation as follows, so alpha, if alpha normally beta will hold in such an interpretation, if and only if the upper rank of alpha is less than the lower rank of alpha and not beta. So we've just changed these things to have these, um, uh, the, these upper and lower ranks. Now we still have preferences between valuations with these things, uh, but it's just a slightly weaker uh, standard of, of uh, of preference. So if you've got two intervals which overlap, for example, then those valuations are going to be incomparable. Whereas if one interval is completely to the left of another interval, that's when we say that that valuation 
is more preferred. So here's an example of an interval-based interpretation. We've got four valuations here, and we can have the, um, the following conditionals. Um, th this, this conditional holds, for example. If you've got MRS, then we look at all the MRS valuations, and we see actually that the top one is dominated by the bottom one, right? because the interval is completely to the left. But these other two are incomparable. So those are the two minimal ones, right? So we see that S is true in both. So we do have the S, if F, M or S, then normally S. We don't have this conditional if M or S, then normally M, if and only S. And we also don't have if M, if and only if not S, because then if we're looking at these, uh, these two valuations of that sentence, we don't conclude S here because they're both incomparable and S isn't true in, S is false in this one. Uh, so this actually serves as a counter example for why rational monotonicity doesn't hold for these, uh, for these interpretations. So this gives us semantics for these disjunctive consequence relations. Um, and every, in fact, we've got the representation result here, which is also, I mean, it's kind of similar to what was proved already in the 90s by Michael Freund. Hansrott also um, gave, a, gave a proof of this uh, in the context of belief, contract, belief contraction. So now we're going to move away from the ranked interpretations and we, instead of seeking the simplest ranked interpretation to satisfy a knowledge base, which is what the rational closure does, we're instead going to ask the question, what now is the simplest interval based interpretation satisfying the knowledge base? And then that's going to give us a corresponding notion of conditional inference. So what we're going to do now is, is describe it briefly in an example our proposal for this simplest interval-based interpretation uh, which we call the disjunctive rational closure because it kind of we use the rational closure as a starting point. So all the details are in the paper I'm just going to give an example of, for the for the construction method uh, on this particular example. So I'm going to use the same knowledge base that I had previously with, and this was the rational closure for that one. It's the, the usual rational closure of the Tweety knowledge base. We want to, def we want to define the, 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 this special interval-based interpretation, the simplest one. So starting with the lower ranks, we use the, the rational closure to actually give us the lower ranks. So the idea is that we, we, quite, we still quite like the rational closure. It's, it still gives quite a nice intuitive answer the only problem is we, we, think some, we think it gives you more conclusions that, that are really justified based on the knowledge base. So this is why we use the rational closure as a starting point in the construction to give the lower ranks. Then we need to give the upper ranks for each of these valuations. Now, if the lower rank of the rational closure is infinity here, then the, we set the upper rank to be infinity as well. Okay, so that takes care of those, uh, these two valuations up at the top here. Otherwise, the idea is that we want to extend the upper ranks as much as possible while satisfying the knowledge base. Okay, that's the overall idea. So precisely what we do depends on whether the valuation verifies a conditional in, in the rational closure or not. Um, so we, evaluation verifies a conditional by that, we mean that it's a minimal, uh, so if you've got a conditional if alpha then beta, it verifies that conditional if basically if it's a minimal model, if, it, if it's a minimal uh, alpha valuation in the model, okay? Now, if V doesn't verify any of the conditionals, then that essentially means that it's not really constrained by the knowledge base, okay? So in that case, what we do is we're gonna set the upper rank as far as it'll go. Okay, we just set the upper rank of those valuations that don't verify anything to be the highest finite rank that we've got in the rational closure. So these four valuations don't actually verify any of the conditionals. All right, so we put the upper ranks to be two in this case, which is the, the highest rank possible. Okay, so note that for these bottom two now, we're not forced anymore to, to, to assume that they're the most plausible uh, valuations, we've got kind of a range here that we've kind of uh, included in the model, the full range. It could be anywhere here. If V does verify a conditional, 
then we just we continue to try and stretch the upper rank as much as possible but we still want we want to make sure that the, the conditional is still satisfied in this model so we can do that by setting the upper rank to be if v verifies alpha normally beta then we just set the upper rank to be the rank of alpha and not beta minus one okay if it verifies more than one conditional then we just take the minimum so in this case, for example, we've got these two values. So this valuation here, B not F and P, that verifies the third conditional here, P normally not F. So the idea is that we want to stretch the upper rank, uh, sorry, as much as possible, but we're not allowed to make it as, we, we, we ha it has to be strictly lower than this one, all right? Because if we make it, incomparable with that one we'll no longer get this conditional holding all right so that's why we set the upper rank here to be the rank of p and f in this case minus one which is just one okay and a similar story for that uh, for this valuation here which which verifies the first conditional and that gives us our interval based model of the disjunctive rational closure so what we end up with is something which infers fewer conditionals than the rational closure does. And usually it will be strictly more, strictly fewer conditionals. So for example, this conditional, if not F, then normally not B, that's in the rational closure, but it's not in this disjunctive rational closure. So in the paper, we give a lot of, uh, uh, a bit more detail on, on the properties of this, this particular construction that we've given. We show that it satisfies a number of postulates, for example, forms of syntax independence, representation independence. We also show that there are some properties which you might expect which don't hold. For example, the vacuity property, which is the one which says that if the preferential closure of your knowledge base is already a disjunctive uh, relation, then we might as well just take that to be the output. We, we don't need to do anything special in that case. In fact, that doesn't hold, but the reason is, well, we've got a good reason why it doesn't hold, is because we've got an impossibility result in the paper which shows that this, this result, this property actually conflicts with other equally intuitive ones. So we can't, we can't have all of the intuitive ones that we want. And I'll finally just want to mention that it, the, this disjunctive rational closure is very much a base driven approach in that adding conditionals that are inferred actually might lead you to con conclude more uh, more conditionals which is uh, contrary to the rational closure the rational closure doesn't have that uh, uh, behavior so to conclude so we've introduced the disjunctive rational closure which is a method for conditional inference uh, under uh, the property of disjunctive rationality without the assumption of rational monotonicity. And for future work, uh, we'd like to examine more postulates for the disjunctive rational closure. So for example, here, and just to give an advert for the, the paper of Kearney's Berner et al at the main conference uh, this week at KR, uh, they give a couple of interesting properties which would be interesting to examine in our context. And then finally, uh, we, we, everything we've done so far has just been purely in the propositional case. Uh, so a, a, an obvious uh, further step would be to um, look at more expressive languages, especially uh, in, in description logics. So that's it, thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. And I will start my talk now and we'll dive in quickly with uh, the motivation. And we will talk about the usage of conditionals in natural language. So uh, the conditional B given A is, can be read as if A then B. And uh, this is called the suppositional account for uh, conditionals because for instance, if you believe B and the supposition that A is true, this does not remove B. So you may and must accept if A then B so on this account, there's no need that A furthers B or supports B or is evidence or even a reason for B. So this notion is also depicted in the classical Ramsey test and conditionals are often interpreted using the Ramsey test. So the 
assume that an agent happens to believe B and let's assume further that her beliefs are consistent with A or maybe that she actually already believes A, then according to the Ramsey test, the agent is committed to accepting the conditional B given A. So there's no need to be any relation of relevance or support between uh, the two formulas A and B. So in particular, if you happen to believe A and B for some reason, this is also sufficient to require the acceptance of the condition. But well, uh, this is not how we interpret conditionals in, our, in the natural language usage. Uh, this was also proved by an empirical study which Skovgaard and Olsen have conducted because they concluded that the positive relevance reading or also called reason relation reading of indicative conditionals is a conventional aspect of their meaning and that it cannot be canceled out without any contradictions. So meaning if we say if A then B, then we expect A to be relevant for B. And uh, we will also give a quick example of what we mean by relevance here. So let's say we have an agent and our agent wanted to escape the hustle and bustle of the city and decided to move into an old farmhouse in the countryside. So unfortunately, the weather quickly changed and it changed and it became cold C. Due to the low temperatures, one of the rather old pipes in the house broke now, this is B, and the agent had to call a plumber P to get the damage fixed. Uh, in this example, it is clear that the cold temperatures are the reason for the broken pipe, yet this is not well reflected if we use standard conditionals. Um, we would rather say that the pipe broke because it was cold. So the question is now, how can we uh, adapt the classical Ramsey test to capture the idea that the antecedent of a con conditional should make a difference to the consequent? And this is something, this is a question which we explored in our paper. And here are our main con contributions. This, uh, so Rod answered this question by introducing the relevant Ramsey test and difference making conditionals, uh, which she has studied in a qualitative framework. And we reformulated this relevant Ramsey test for the framework of Spohn's ranking functions. And uh, we transferred this one difference making conditionals to the to this framework and provided a simple and elegant semantics using a set of conditionals. Uh, we also showed that this reformulation is fully compatible with the logic behind difference making conditionals. Um, also, we provided an uh, inductive representation for a set of difference making conditionals using C representations and also a method to revise a ranking function with a difference making conditionals based on C revisions, both uh, methods that are introduced by Gabriele Kennisberg. So, so a quick introduction into conditionals and the relevant Ramsey test in general. So uh, we have the standard conditional language and there a standard conditional B given A expresses if A holds, then B should follow plausibly where A is the, is the antecedent of the conditional and B is the consequent. So, and we extended this framework of conditionals to a language with might conditionals, which express a weakening of the notion of standard conditionals. Um, as for standard conditionals, we call C the antecedent and D the consequence. But in terms of natural language, a might conditional expresses if C holds, then D might be the case. And also uh, a conditional knowledge basis, we call a finite set of standard and might conditionals, a conditional knowledge base. And uh, to give an appropriate semantics to conditional knowledge bases, we need epistemic states. Um, the conditional knowledge base is consistent if it is cons consistent if and only if there is a representation of an epistemic state that accepts all conditionals in data. Turn to uh, our semantics. We to the framework of ranking functions, and ranking functions, also called ordinary conditional functions, first introduced by Spohn, uh, are functions which map uh, omega, so the set of all possible words, to a plausibility rank kappa of omega, 
on the condition that they are most plausible worlds, ranked zero. Uh, the higher the rank of kappa omega is, the less plausible omega is. And we determine a rank of a formula A uh, by the rank of minimal worlds satisfying A. Uh, here in our paper, the empty rank, uh, the empty set has infinite rank. So, standard conditionals in this framework are accepted uh, if, uh, if the verification of the conditionals, so the words A, B are more plausible than the uh, words falsifying the conditionals, so the words A, not B, or uh, if the premise has infinite rank, so if the premise is always false. We can also define acceptance for my conditionals uh, by saying that condition that the words verifying the might conditional CD are more or equally plausible as, as the words falsifying it, or again if the um, a premise is always false. Note here that accepting the might conditionals is not equivalent to the acceptance of the negation of the conditional, not D given C but weaker since it allows for indifference between both cases. So neither the conditional nor its negation may be accepted. Yes, and back to our main problem. How can we encounter a notion of relevance expressing that the antecedence of a conditional is relevant to the consequent? And we can do this uh, by taking the relevant Ramsey test and first introduced by Hopkins. So the antecedent should make a difference to the consequent without introducing the dependence on the actual belief status and Hott uh, formulated this as uh, the consequent is accepted if we revise the belief state by the antecedent, but this consequent should, be, should fail to be accepted if we revise by the negation of the antecedent. So in formulas we, we can say it like this. So, and conditionals governed by this relevant Ramsey test are called difference-making conditionals and express the notions if A, then relevant to B. So, Roth's idea was actually to liken conditionals to the natural language connectives because or since, to express a cause or reason. Note here that in contrast to the natural language since A, then B, uh, since A, B, the acceptance of the difference-making conditional uh, does not entail that A is true or has any other particular belief status here. Okay, now we'll further elaborate on the relevant Ramsey test. So, as we've seen, the relevant Ramsey test is more complex than the standard Ramsey test. So, it is not surprising that difference making conditionals do not satisfy some of the usual principles for standard conditionals, such as cautious monotony, cut, and or. Also, right weakening is invalid, and um, what called this the hallmark of, uh, of the relevance relation. Uh, it actually makes sense that difference making conditionals uh, um, invalidate this right weakening because difference making conditionals express that uh, the antecedent is a cause or a reason for the consequence, and I wanted to give a quick example on this. For example, if you say, if you pay an extra fee for your letter, the, then the letter will be delivered by Express because this fee buys you a special service. But it sounds odd to say, if you pay an extra fee, your letter will be delivered because the letter would be delivered anyway, whether you pay the extra fee or not. So even though many of the familiar principles for standard conditionals become invalid for difference-making conditionals, this does not mean there's no logic to them. The basic principles, which are depicted here, uh, explore this logic. So we will not discuss them in, details, in detail, but for example, 2B is a non-horn condition, which, may, which means that reasoning with difference-making conditionals is not trivial. And in order to determine what follows from a set of difference making conditionals, we cannot simply apply the axioms of closure. So we need special inference methods, for example, C representations. So, now we turn to the ranking semantics for difference making conditionals. Um, so we can reformulate the relevant Ramsey tests for ranking functions uh, if we say that B is in the belief set of the revision of kappa by A, 
and B is not in the belief set of the revision of kappa by not A. So using some basic properties of ranking functions, we can reformulate the conditions above since they imply constraints on the revision uh, kappa with A and kappa with not A. So and this part corresponds to the standard Ramsey test, whereas this part corresponds to a slight variant of the Ramsey test for my conditionals. Eventually, we can say uh, that we can use standard and might conditionals to express that the antecedent of the conditional is relevant to the consequence by, uh, by splitting the two directions of the relevant Ramsey test. So, uh, if we replace the general representing state in the basic principles there with the ranking function kappa, then we can check the principles for our reformulation and we got the result that the basic principles are satisfied and therefore serve the logic behind difference making conditionals also via our reformulation. So, uh, we continue with our example. Remember the agent's pipe broke because the temperatures were too low and therefore she had to call a plumber to have the pipe fixed. We can express the situation of the agent using difference making conditionals here and then use our reformulation of the relevant Bremser test to express the difference making conditionals as a set of standard and might conditionals. Um, note here that even if the might conditionals sound a bit odd, the reason relation would be neglected if we only use the standard conditionals. So to express that the antecedent is a cause for the consequence, we need them both together. Yeah. And now we will define an inductive representation and a revision with difference making conditions. So again, we use our reformulation to define the inductive uh, representation and use C revisions. C, uh, C representations. C representations are capable to repre uh, of representing sets of standard and might conditionals due to their high adaptability, since they define a ranking function by adding up impact factors for each conditional in delta. So these impact factors correspond to the standard conditionals and these correspond to the might conditionals in the, in the set delta. Uh, the impact factors are the crucial part of the C representation because they ensure that the resulting ranking function satisfies all conditionals in delta because they explore the relation between the conditionals in delta by punishing worlds that fortify the conditionals. The de definition of the impact factors for standard and might conditionals, which we skipped here because it's really lengthy, uh, is, actually this, uh, is actually the same for, save for the strictness of the inequalities. So for the standard conditionals, we need strict inequalities and for the might conditionals, we don't need strict inequalities. This is due to the acceptance conditions that we've seen before. So uh, also note that C representations are not unique since the solution of the system of inequalities defining these impact factors is not unique. However, if the system of inequalities has a solution, uh, then delta is consistent. For the converse, it is certain that every consistent set of standard conditionals has a C representation, but it is still an open question whether this results to it. Uh, uh, whether this result extends to a set of mixed conditions, so standard and mild conditions. This is still part of our ongoing work. So, and we will continue our example and construct the C representation using the uh, set delta that we defined before. So here we have the solution of the system of inequalities and we chose the minimal impact factors uh, so one for the standard conditionals and zero for the might conditionals and they will correspond to the uh, relevance conditionals we've seen before. So here are the impact factors which we added up according to the world's for, uh, to the world, the, to the conditionals they falsified and here for example for not C, B, not P, the st standard conditional B, uh, P given B is falsified and the, might, the first might conditional here is falsified. So we add these two impact factors up and we get the following C representation which satisfies delta. Okay. So um, 
Now we turn to the revision by difference making conditionals. Um, and we define a revision using C revisions because they are an adaptable revision method capable of also, also capable just as C representation of dealing with a set of standard and made conditionals which we can revise with simultaneously. So uh, again, we use our reformulation and here we have the C revision, which is kappa zero plus the rank of the world kappa omega together uh, with the, either the impact factor for falsifying the standard conditional here or the might conditional. Uh, the inequalities defining the impact factors follow from the success condition and are depicted here. They are a bit shorter than the one for the C representation, so that's why we depicted them here. Um, and as before, here we can see it, the main difference between the two is the strictness of the inequalities. So here we have a strict inequality and here we have a non-strict inequality. Uh, kappa zero here is a normalizing factor which ensures that we have most plausible words and we can revise by this by the relevance uh, by the difference making conditional because the set def defining the difference making conditionals is a difference making conditional is always consistent so the, uh, because the antecedents of the conditionals a and not a they are exclusive so this set of two conditionals is always consistent and there always exists a C revision. Note again that uh, due to the system of inequalities here, C revisions as C representations are not unique because the solution is not unique. Yes, and we will turn back to our example. Uh, so let's say we have a plumber that, ar that arrives at the house of the agent and tells her that another common reason for broken pipes could be deposits in the pipe, which is D. So uh, the agent has to revise her belief state with the new difference making conditional that the reason for the broken pipe is are the deposits in the pipe. And we can reformulate that again as a standard conditional and as a might conditional and we extend our ranking function uh, with the new variable d, but the ranks stay the same. So here we can calculate the impact factors according to the system of inequalities we've seen before, and we can choose minimal ones. So the impact factor for the standard condition is one, and the one for the weak is zero. So this is the prior ranking function extended with the variable D for deposits. Uh, here we have the schematic C revisions with the impact factors for word falsifying the conditional if D then relevantly B. And here we see the, here are the standard conditionals falsified and here the weak ones. And they do not interfere each other. Oh, yeah, and here we have the calculated ranks. Uh, and the normalization constant here is zero. So uh, as we can see, kappa accepts the new conditional and also the acceptance of the new conditional does not override the relevant, uh, the difference making conditions, conditional we had before. Now we come to the conclusion. Um, as we've seen, difference making conditionals aim at capturing the intuition that the antecedent A of a conditional is relevant to its consequent, meaning that A supports B or is a reason or evidence for it. And this idea is encoded in the relevant Ramsey test, ruling that revising by the antecedent should lead to acceptance of the consequent, which is the standard Ramsey test, but also ruling that revising by the negation of the antecedent should not lead to the acceptance of the consequent. Yes. And uh, in the present paper, we extended this uh, hans Watts approach to ranking functions by first transferring uh, the relevant Ramsey test to the framework of uh, ranking functions and then also define difference making conditional as a pair of uh, standard and might conditionals. And this reformulation is in full compliance with the basic principles that what defined. And using this transformation, we could benefit from the flexible approach of C representations 
and see revisions to define inductive representation for difference making conditionals and also a revision me method with one difference making condition. So, yes. Yes, thank you, Laura, for sharing. So, uh, yeah, this is joint work with Gabriela, Matthias, and Kenneth from. Uh, here in Dortmund and Koblenz, and it's actually part of a broader project uh, where we are looking on closer into the connections between argumentation and conditional logics, which are two fields of knowledge representation which have coexisted peacefully, I would say, without uh, many interactions between them. Uh, and so this talk in particular will consist of a translation of non-monotonic conditional logics, in particular system Z, into abstract dialectical frameworks. Uh, oh, I make presentation. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, I will pre uh, introduce shortly non-monotonic conditionals and in particular system Z. Then I will introduce abstract dialectical frameworks and then I will show you how we interpret it these defeasible conditionals in ADFs. So non-monotonic conditionals, I'm quite lucky because we already had a lot of good talks introducing non-monotonic conditionals. So as you already know by now, these conditionals are pairs of formulas where um, a pair of formulas means that uh, phi is normally the case if psi is the case. And in this talk, we, we restricted, or in this paper, we restricted our attention to literal conditionals, which means that both the antecedent psi and the consequent phi are literals. And yeah, so a set of conditionals is literal if all of the conditionals in the set are literals. And these conditionals, they can actually be seen as indicator functions for possible worlds in the sense that a world can either uh, accept the conditional or validate the conditional if it makes true both the antecedent and the consequent. It can falsify a conditional if it makes true the antecedent but fal falsifies the consequent. And it can be indifferent with respect to conditional if it uh, falsifies the antecedent. And in, more in particular, the semantics that we looked at for interpreting these conditionals are OCFs or ranking-based semantics, which were already explained very uh, well by previous authors uh, presenting in this session today. So uh, just a quick reminder, we start with a, a function kappa, which maps possible worlds to natural numbers and possibly infinity. And uh, then we can extend this function to also map formulas to natural numbers by saying that uh, the rank of a formula is the rank of the most plausible or minimal uh, model validating this formula. And then a formula uh, conditional is accepted if the rank of the consequent, the conjunction of the consequent and the antecedent is smaller than the rank of the uh, antecedent and the negation of the consequent. And then finally, when we have this kappa or this OCF, it's also useful to define the beliefs um, expressed by this OCF. And these are all of the formulas that are validated by all of the most plausible worlds. So all the formulas made true by all of the formulas which have rank zero. And then in the paper, we, we focused attention on system set, which is a specific system to obtain OCFs accepting consistent sets of conditionals. And actually already uh, Richard introduced the system. So the idea is that worlds are assumed maximally plausible while retaining acceptance of Delta. And then um, this is done by using a partitioning of the rules and a, uh, based on a consistency test, but I don't have to go into details now for this talk. But if you're interested in this, we can talk about it later, of course. I will illustrate now system Z with an example. Suppose we have this knowledge base, which is known as the Tweety knowledge base. So we have that birds normally fly, penguins are normally birds, and penguins normally don't fly. Then we see, for example, that the last conditional here, uh, penguins normally don't fly, is accepted because the world um, validating or accepting this conditional is the minimal world accepting this conditional is, has 
a higher plausibility, so a lower rank, than all of the worlds falsifying this condition. And for example, if we look at the beliefs uh, validated by this OCF, we see that B is not a belief because there is at least one world which doesn't validate B and which is maximally plausible. And we see that not B is a belief because all of the maximally plausible worlds validate not B. So that's how system set works, a very nice logic for reasoning with uh, non-monotonic conditionals. And now the second uh, component of our translation are abstract dialectical frameworks. And abstract dialectical frameworks are a formalism for doing argumentation, um, which has been devised or is popular because it generalizes many arg argumentation formalisms. So I guess most people know at least abstract argumentation where you have a set of notes and argumentative attacks between these notes. Um, and then people propose generalizations. For example, they said, okay, we can allow for supports between arguments or we can allow for uh, text from sets of arguments. And to, to unify all these approaches, people came up with abstract dialectical frameworks where uh, tuples are studied consisting of nodes, which would be the arguments in abstract, abstract argumentation links between these nodes, which in abstract argumentation would just be attacks, and then conditions uh, on these nodes, which are intended to give an exact meaning to these links, because now the links can represent anything, and we want to, of course, be able to specify what they should mean. Uh, yeah, and these conditions, they are just Boolean formulas formulated in the language of the parents given the links of a statement. This is quite abstract, so let me give an example. Suppose we have an ADF consisting of three nodes or arguments, B, F, and P. And then we could, for example, have a support from P to B. And this is expressed by saying that the condition of B is P. Or we could have an attack from, not from P to F by saying that in the condition we have not P. And then there is also a support of B from F by saying that, uh, yeah, the condition is not P or B. So this is how abstract dialectical frameworks are formulated. Now we want to know what are the semantics of ADFs. And most of the semantics are rather complicated, but in this talk I will focus on the two-valued models, which are very simple. So the, uh, an interpretation is a model if for every node S we have that um, if the node is not undecided, then the interpretation will assign the same truth value to the node and the condition of the node. By the way, in ADFs, people use uh, three-valued interpretations over our nodes to um, give semantics to ADFs. And so we focus on a very simple subset of these models, which are two-valued models. So the idea is that first, uh, every node is uh, assigned either true or false. And then we also require that every node will have the same um, truth value Oh, sorry, the same truth value as its condition. So let's look at our example maybe to see how this works. We just uh, write down all of the two valued interpretations. So all of the nodes are uh, assigned either true, bot, or false, uh, sorry, false, bot, or true, top. And then we have to check if every node has the same truth value as its condition. So we see for the first interpretation, this is not the case because F has another interpretation as its condition. For the second interpretation, this is not the case either, because here we have B, and then for the condition of B, which is P, we have a uh, top. However, for the third one, we do have a two-valued model because all of the nodes have the same truth value as their condition. And then we check this for all of the interpretations, and we see that there are two two-valued models of this ADF. And that's uh, how the two-valued model semantics works. So th these two formalisms have rather different um, semantics, but now you might wonder, okay, why, why do you want to interpret defeasible conditionals in ADFs? Well, because we think that syntactically, the, these two formalisms have some, some things in common. In fact, they both operate on um, pairs of formulas 
where for the feasible conditionals, this pair stands for if psi is true, then usually phi is true as well. And in ADFs, we can see our ADF actually as um, pairs of nodes with their condition. And they say something similar. They say if S is accepted, then C, then the condition of S has to be accepted as well. So in the paper, we try to answer the question, okay, how, how, how do these semantics, these different semantics, but um, common syntax relate? And we defined an interpretation or a translation of these defeasible conditional in ADFs. And to do this, we needed first some technical work. In particular, we needed to define a negated or we needed to introduce a fresh negation, which doesn't occur in the original language. And so uh, given a set of atoms, now we introduce for every atom, this uh, freshly negated atom, which will be treated also as an at atom. So we needed to, to do a little technical trick to make everything work. And then we also need to define some functions which allow us to go from the original language to the language over the, including these freshly negated um, atoms and uh, vice versa, uh, which you see here, but I won't go into details on that. So now I can um, introduce the translation from conditional logics to ADFs. And the idea is, as you might have already guessed, because I introduced these freshly negated atoms, so um, the nodes of this ADF will consist of all of the atoms occurring somehow in the conditional knowledge base together with this fresh negation of atoms occurring in the conditional knowledge base. And then the condition for any of these nodes looks quite complicated perhaps, but, but uh, it can be easily explained. So we require that the contrary of uh, a node is not the case to ensure that these freshly negated or freshly introduced negations actually behave as a negation. And then we say for every conditional in the knowledge base for which uh, the node that we are considering occurs as an antecedent, the consequent has to be true as well. So here I've written out these uh, conditions for um, um, atoms, uh, but I think an example might be more helpful. So for example, if we have the Tweety uh, knowledge base, we get uh, because we have three atoms, we get six nodes, the original atoms, and then the atoms uh, with a fr freshly introduced negation. And then we say, for example, that B can be accepted only if not B is the case and, is, and if F is the case. So uh, as you might notice, uh, the, the direction of the conditionals has somehow changed. Here we say, okay, B is the case. Uh, if B is the case, then F will be the case. And in the translation, we say B can be the case only if F is the case. And then for the other nodes, the, something similar happens. Um, and we see if we look closer at this example, that we get adequacy for the Tweety example in the sense that all of the two valued models of this ADF are maximally plausible worlds of the translated knowledge base. And all of the maximally plausible worlds of the translated knowledge base also occur as two valued models of our translated ADF. And this is no coincidence because, um, yeah, we, we get adequacy for this translation for any conditional knowledge base, well, for any literal conditional knowledge base. Um, yeah, this adequacy is shown by two propositions. So first, um, every two valued model if we translate it back to the original language, will be a maximally plausible world of the conditional knowledge base using the system Z ranking. And then vice versa, if we have a maximally plausible world using the system Z ranking for the conditional knowledge base, then again, modulo our translation into the extended language, we get that this world will be also a two-valued model of the translated um, the translated knowledge base. And then we also get, of course, adequacy on the level of uh, inference relation, which is not so surprising, uh, but these two propositions are really the motor behind uh, this theorem. 
And in fact, also for three-valued semantics, we get kind of an um, adequ adequacy result in the sense that for any three-valued model of the a ADF, we can show that the um, any conditional is accepted. So if the antecedent is true in this three-valued model, then the consequent of a conditional will be true as well. And yeah, because we have three-valued um, models in ADFs, this is of course a, a weaker kind of adequacy than we had for the two-valued models. So that already concludes my talk. So what did I present? Well, an interpretation of non-monotonic conditionals in ADFs, which is adequate on the level of release for all of the semantics. And furthermore, it can be calculated in polynomial time. And it is modular in the sense that changes in the original conditional knowledge base, if they are local, will result in local changes in the translation. And furthermore, it's syntax-based, which, which means that the, the translation is based purely on the syntax of a conditional knowledge base, which is quite an important point, I think, because uh, two-valued model semantics of ADFs are equivalent to propositional logic. So, of course, we could derive maybe a simpler um, translation or a uh, translation that doesn't need these uh, freshly introduced negations, but then it wouldn't be any more syntax-based. And yeah, um, as I already hinted at, it's not language preserving because we need to introduce these new atoms with our freshly introduced negation. And one thing that we are still thinking about or, or um, have to do some more work on is the question whether this translation is also adequate with respect to conditional entailment. Because right now we can only look at, um, on the conditional side of the translation, look at the beliefs which are the most plausible worlds but of course we would also look uh, like to look at the worlds which are which have a rank which is higher than zero and for this we have some more work to do because we have to define somehow conditional entailment in adfs and this brings me to future work so in future work we want to uh, yeah of course further investigate the relation between ocfs and argumentation in particular, we want to look at uh, revision of ADFs and the Ramsey test because uh, we believe that this is a good way to define conditional ADFs on the side, uh, conditional inference on the side of ADFs. And so that might will allow us to compare also ADFs and OCFs um, on, on levels more sophisticated than just the level of belief. And furthermore, we believe that our translation can be helpful um, to obtain inconsistency tolerant conditional inference because uh, using the three valued semantics of ADFs, you can tolerate inconsistencies, which uh, for OCFs, there hasn't been that much research on reasoning with inconsistent knowledge bases. And finally, uh, one other restriction of our translation is that it only works for, con for literal conditional knowledge bases. And so we are also investigating propositional ADFs where the nodes um, are not atomic, but can also be uh, Boolean propositions. So, yeah, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, would be happy to take questions now.